Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our virtual speaker series. My name is Carrie, and I'm with EarthSafe Canada, and we are very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Tushar Mehta. Dr. Mehta will be speaking on the plant-based diet in relation to health and ecology. Welcome, Tushar. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Our pleasure to have you. So a little bit about Dr. Mehta. Uh, Tujar completed medical school and his residency at the University of Toronto, and he currently practices emergency medicine. He also participates in international health, pro uh, health projects. Uh, previously, he was an annual volunteer in rural India, and he is now doing work in Haiti. He also works with small NGOs and is a medical advisor for Project Canoe in Toronto. Dr. Mehta co-founded Plant-Based Data, it's an online database that collects and organizes academic literature regarding the impact of plant and animal agriculture on health, environment, food security, and pandemics. Dr. Mehta is interested in an evidence and data-based approach to ecological issues embedded in humanitarianism. Now, a little bit of housekeeping before I um, hand this over to Tushar. Uh, Tushar will be speaking for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. If you are live with us today, please post any questions you have via Facebook or YouTube. And anyone that posts a question will go into a draw for one gift certificate for $25 that's been donated by Vegan Supply. Okay, over to you, Tushar. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, give me one second here as I get it set up. All right. And there. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about plant-based diet and health today. All right. And thanks for the wonderful introduction. I think you've covered the main points that I have in these slides about my background. And we hear so many things about plant-based diets and all kinds of diets. Um, some of you may know these athletes uh, who are featured in Game Changers. Um, some of them were, at least. Um, and uh, you know, these are vegan athletes who are quite successful and uh, showing you know, what can be done on a plant-based diet. Now, these are great examples, but um, we want to know more about the research. Okay. So firstly, what is a plant-based diet? Okay, a plant-based diet uh, is when the majority of somebody's protein and calories come from plant sources as opposed to animal sources. So we also want to upgrade that to not just being talking about a plant-based diet, but a whole food plant-based diet. And in, in most cases, kind of low or low-ish in fat, right? Um, so that means we're focusing on whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, okay? And minimizing sort of processed foods, or at least the worst processed foods. We want to be low fat in most cases, um, or low-ish. And when we talk about plant-based diet, this, you know, this means vegan diet, but it also includes vegetarian diets, pescatarian diets, flexitarian diets, you know, where in all of these, the majority of the protein and calories are going to come from whole plant sources, um, preferably. Okay. So, um, now when somebody, um, when, when, what the research shows about plant-based diets is that generally there are lower rates of all-cause mortality. Uh, that means the amount of people who die during the duration of a study when mortality is studied as part of the research. Uh, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, higher, hypertension, and also dementia and some other disease, diseases. Now, these are very important diseases. Now, this is a slide I use sometimes. Um, where we have this one yoga teacher who says, um, you know, uh, he practiced yoga all his life and died at the age of uh, uh, 96. And this other uh, famous person in India who uh, drank whiskey all his life and died at the age of 99. And so the moral of the story is that whiskey gives you a three year edge over yoga. Now we know that's kind of funny, but what we, what this tells us is kind of like, we need to sort of, we need to look at research of that includes many people, groups of people, not individual examples when we talk about science, 
All right. Now, medical science is composed of two main components. That means basic sciences where they do sort of research in test tubes and the animals. They're looking at physiology and mechanisms by which the body works and by which diseases are caused. But then there's also clinical science where you look at groups of people and the outcomes when you study groups of people in real life when it comes to medications, testing, but also diet. OK, and that's clinical science. And that's what we want to use as our basis for understanding the health uh, um, regarding dietary choices, okay? So nutrition research is usually done in long-term cohort studies, okay? And so you have long, you know, you're following people in real life uh, for many years, big groups of people in, in real life over a number of years and seeing what happens to people over time. Now, sometimes there are smaller studies for a shorter period of time, that uh, include randomized trials where you actually take some people and you say, okay, have this diet for a certain amount of time or this diet for a certain amount of time and then see the effects in the short term on people. When we're doing any kind of nutrition research, we're always comparing different groups with different diets, okay? So a group of people with one diet versus another diet. We want groups of people, their baseline characteristics to be as similar as possible. You don't want to compare people in India having a plant-based diet versus people in Canada having an omnivorous diet, that's not a good comparison group. You want people who are overall having the same parameters and then having sort of dietary differences within that and not too many other confounding factors. Like for example, in one group, the people are much more educated and rich compared to the other group who may be more poor, et cetera. Okay. And sometimes we also question where funding comes from. Now, the most important parameter when we're studying diet is all-cause mortality, okay? We want to know in a study how many people died over a period of study. This is referring to the long-term cohort studies, as I mentioned, when you're, when you're following a group of people over a long period, okay, of time and seeing if there's differences in mortality. This is one of the most measurable things that really makes a difference, okay? And there is good information. This is just one example of a study, but there are others uh, showing that people who are having a more plant-based diet compared to uh, a diet where there's higher levels of animal protein intake, that there are um, differences in the death rate. So 3% uh, of energy from animal protein replaced by plant protein resulted in 10% less mortality in men and women um, and these are, you know, this is a study when there's, where there's about, uh, um, over 200,000 men and 179,000 women, um, who are enrolled in the National Institutes of Health and you know, medium age of 62 and up, and then follow for, for about 16 years. Okay. So they're actually showing that people substituting and eating more plant-based instead of animal-based protein, um, are having lower mortality rates. It also depends on the type of animal protein that people are eating, showing here that red meat and eggs had some of the worst impact, and then some other animal proteins are less detrimental, but still the plant protein wins out, okay? And that study showed that there's less all-cause mortality, mortality from any cause, and also less death from heart disease, okay? And there's also some reduced cancer in, 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 in some of the subgroups there, okay, for people having more plant-based diet. Another study, similar, okay, um, the nurse's health study and the health professional follow-up study. So a group of women and a group of men, large numbers, we're talking over 100,000 people here, and followed for over 22 years. And we see basically that when we're substituting plant protein for different types of animal protein, there's a mortality benefit, there's lower death rates. It doesn't mean that people can live forever or they won't die or they won't get sick from something, but overall the risk is lower. The things to learn here are also that, number one, you don't just depend on one study for getting your knowledge. There are uh, multiple studies showing uh, lower all-cause mortality. Um, and so we look at, you know, a, a balance of evidence. We're looking at multiple studies to sort of form our opinion. I've only shown two here, but there are others as well that lead us to believe or to understand that there's lower mortality rates when people are following plant-based diets. Um, the other thing is that... Um, this is again about risk rates. If somebody um, is eating animal-based foods or smoking or versus having a plant-based diet, et cetera, 
it just means that there's lower risk in a population. It doesn't mean that every single person in that population is going to live longer time uh, versus the other population. It just means there's a higher chance uh, of better outcomes in one population compared to the other population. So medical science is all about you know, risk and statistics. It's not about, you know, you do this and you have a guaranteed outcome. Um, so one good example on one side or a bad example on one side by itself doesn't prove anything. We're looking at statistics, okay? Um, and again, this is another third study I've presented here showing that there are uh, mortality benefits uh, for people on a plant-based diet, okay? I'm not gonna get into all the details of statistics here because I have a lot of slides to go through. Um, but, uh, in the era of modern medicine, in many cases, we keep people alive for a very long time using medications and technology to do so. For example, I practice emergency medicine. We get people with heart attacks all the time. We have excellent medications and we can diagnose things quickly. We can send people to the cath lab and get an angiogram and put a stent in and save lives that way. So even if people are having um, a more similar or a uh, mortality rate, regardless of their health behaviors or their diet, um, we can still keep people alive we can using medical technology. But the other thing that is going on here is quality of life, right? So if people are um, having a healthier diet, a better plant-based diet, then perhaps what we're doing now is, is somewhat keeping people alive longer, but also we're increasing the health that they experience during their lifetime right? Less medications, less diseases, less hospital trips, less disabilities that result from all these diseases, these chronic diseases. So moving from all-cause mortality, we can talk about cardiovascular disease or heart disease, okay? So this is, a, this is a big deal. Heart disease is one of the biggest causes or mortality in most developed countries, right? And again, there are um, uh, there's good research showing that people having plant-based diets have reduction in cardiovascular diseases. And the studies that show decrease in cardiovascular diseases should hopefully also show a decrease in all-cause mortality because you don't want to sort of save people from heart disease, but then people die anyways from something else. You want to see that there is decreased heart disease and decrease all-cause mortality. That's always the case, what the case whether, whatever the parameter that you're studying. So again, you know, multiple studies showing that healthy plant-based diets uh, reduce diseases. Now, this study is very important because some of the more modern studies coming out aren't just saying that, okay, if you're on a plant-based diet, you have less disease compared to an, one that includes more animal uh, products uh, or animal proteins, et cetera. But the quality of your diet also matters, okay? So if people are consuming a very poor quality plant-based diet, they're having lots of um, the wrong types of processed foods, you're having a lot of uh, junk food, potato chips, fried foods, um, you know, sugar uh, and um, and refined carbohydrates, ramen noodles, etc. Right? Then that's a poor quality plant based diet. Okay, and in that case, people just like as if they're on animal based, uh, having more animal based foods, they're having increased mortality rates. But it's when people are on a healthy plant based diet that the benefits really manifest, okay? And this is a very important point because it's not just about being more plant-based, it's about being healthy plant-based, whole food plant-based. Now, dementia is a very important disease. I see, we see in the emergency department and in medical practice, we see it in our families, dementia is a terrible disease. It's pretty much as bad as cancers or other serious diseases in terms of people's quality of life and how it impacts everybody around that person who they love and is suffering from dementia. Um, there is more and more evidence that people who are consuming animal products, consuming saturated fat, cholesterol, um, foods containing saturated fat and cholesterol have higher rates of dementia, okay? And also what we consider to be deaf from dementia as well, when people um, become ha have so much dementia that they are not functioning well, and then they end up dying and consider the primary cause of their death or one of the primary causes of their death to be dementia itself. And uh, so there's, there's um, studies showing there's uh, reduced dementia mortality and reduced dementia in people who are having uh, a more plant-based diet, but also 
for people who are consuming more saturated fats and animal proteins, et cetera. Okay, so uh, that's very, very important. There's a lot of talk about omega-3s, fish and heart disease. And the question is, you know, do we really get a benefit from these? And most of the studies, when you look at them in their totality, um, they're not showing much benefit, okay? They're not showing much benefit for heart attack, stroke, depression, et cetera. So where does all the craze come from? There were some early, very small studies that showed there might be a benefit. And we see that people on a pescatarian type diet have um, some benefits. But when you actually study the DHA and EPA, the marine omega-3 um, fatty acids, we're not seeing great consistent evidence that there is a um, reduced cardiovascular disease. Some studies show a benefit, other studies do not. In many cases, it may just be that people who are consuming um, uh, more fish have an overall higher quality diet. They may, um, fish consumption is probably better or less bad compared to you know, other types of animal products. Um, and the people who uh, you know, are pescatarians probably eating less of other animal products and overall may have a more plant-based diet at the same time just eating less animal stuff over time. So that's where may, some of the benefits may come from for pescatarians is that they're actually more plant-based in general and that fish are not as bad as other animal-based foods. However, um, supplementing or the DHA and EPA may not be all it's cracked up to be. Um, but there is some evidence that um, uh, uh, people having plant-based omega-3s do have some benefits. And again, is it because they're eating better plant foods or is it just the ALA itself? It's hard to tease that out. There is some consideration that omega-3s may be good for children and their developing brain. And we'll get to more to that later as well. But when, or actually we'll talk about it now, when people are consuming more fish um, for um, their kid, you know, they're pregnant and they want the omega-3s to benefit um, their baby, their baby's brain, et cetera. Um, we see that there are actually higher concentrations of mercury and other heavy metals that are transferred through the placenta and may have an effect on the baby. So if somebody does want to get the marine omega-3s and, and potentially can benefit a pregnant uh, or lactating woman and their child, um, we would highly, I would highly suggest they get them from algae because you can get algae omega-3s, which are the same as those found in fish, but they can be 100% or like 99.999% free of the toxins that are present in fish. So that's the toxin-free way to go. When it comes to diabetes type 2, um, another major disease affecting people all around the world. Uh, again, we see multiple studies showing that people eating plant-based have lower rates of diabetes, especially again, in this study that, it, that looks at the quality of the plant-based diet. So a high quality plant-based diet um, has an excellent um, reduction in risk for type two diabetes. It doesn't mean you can't get it, but the higher the quality of your plant-based diet, probably the lower the risk of developing diabetes, or even if you have diabetes, it will be less severe, all right? Cancer, all right? So there are a few cancers that show benefit with regards to diet um, and plant-based diet, okay? We'll go through some of the main ones, which are, starts with breast cancer, okay? So breast cancer is the most common um, cause of cancer mortality in women. Um, well, it's between breast and lung, okay? Those are the two ones uh, that are the highest, um, are, cause the highest mortality for women. And again, there is good studies here that people consuming increased uh, dairy do have higher uh, rates of breast cancer over the long run, and that people who have higher soy consumption um, have a reduced rate of breast cancer over the long run. And also survivors of breast cancer consuming more soy products do seem to have some protection against recurrence. Again, this doesn't mean that somebody can't get breast cancer because they're consuming soy products um, or can't get a recurrence. It just means that the risk becomes lower somewhat, okay? And that's an important lowering risk and, and an increased risk with, with dairy consumption as well, okay? Um, and the same is true for prostate cancer in men because prostate cancer is the most common uh, cancer in men. Are, um, it, it'll be, again, up there with uh, some skin cancers and uh, lung cancer, but... Um, uh, 
there are, you know, there's more than one study showing that people who are on a plant-based diet have less prostate cancer, and especially vegan diets seem to beat the rest of the plant-based diets here. Okay. Colon cancer is another important cancer. So the WHO has declared red and processed meat as a class, um, as, as carcinogens, okay? And um, not as bad, let's say, as smoking, but still they are considered carcinogens. And, you know, red meat and processed meats uh, are, are both culprits here, processed meat being worse. Um, and also there are benefits showing, again, plant-based diet and uh, uh, things like lentils being protective relative to those types of um, animal products. Okay, so uh, this is another meat intake and cancer risk uh, from the UK Biobank. It's a study of UK citizens. And again, showing that red meat uh, is particularly more associated with colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. And there, for each 50 gram per day increase, there are um, you know, statistically significant more higher rates of those types of cancer and some similar increases with poultry and certain types of cancer, right? Now, it doesn't mean that plant-based diet is always perfect. There are two uh, recent studies showing that people on a vegan diet or highly plant-based diet, but especially the vegans, had higher hip fracture rates, okay? This is very important because hip fracture is the most devastating type of um, fracture or broken bone that one can have after hip fracture, people can be very debilitated. And in the hospital and in the subsequent, you know, weeks, months, years, there are actually higher mortality rates for people who do suffer hip fractures. Um, so that is some bad news. So why are there more fractures, especially hip fractures in, um, in this population, especially in the vegans? And the fractures were concentrated uh, were basically the higher rates of fractures were basically in women, but not just all women, especially women with a very low body mass index. So women who are very skinny, okay? So women who are very skinny, we already know from other research that they have higher rates of fractures and higher rates of hip fractures because having more body weight actually builds up your bones a little bit more and also provides padding if somebody falls. You have, if, you have, uh, if you fall and there's less padding, um, higher rates of uh, higher chance you can break the bone. Okay. So what can we do about this? I think it shows that there are some people, especially women who are on a vegan diet and they're probably too low in their body weight. Okay. And we have to be careful about this eating more calories, good calories from good sources of calories, like, you know, peanut butter, but not potato chips, let's say, and, um, having more protein and doing more exercise and weight-bearing exercise as well. Because one of the mechanisms by which people who are heavier um, have stronger bones is because they're carrying that weight all the time. And exercise is also shown to strengthen bones. So doing exercise, making sure we're not too skinny and uh, having good amount of calories and protein intake is gonna be very important. Perhaps taking vitamin D may also benefit. Definitely making sure that we're taking enough calcium as well. And uh, it's not just a story of calcium, it's a combination of all these things. And taking B12 and having lots of fruits and vegetables, these are all factors in bone health. So what do I eat, okay? And there's um, Ginny Messina, one of the most um, sort of prominent and amazing plant-based um, registered dietitians. Um, she says, like, eat the rainbow, okay? So we wanna make sure we're eating from the different plant-based food groups, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes, including soy, um, but not necessarily just soy, uh, nuts and seeds, and also some healthy fats and just throw in the good herbs and spices in there too, okay? So um, people often have this debate about whether we are, are we, you know, omnivores or are we herbivores when it, you know, as humans and should we be eating more, uh, you know, um, plant-based because we're meant to be plant-based or what are we meant to actually eat? And there's a lot of um, evidence in terms of how we are closer to herbivores, but most herbivores aren't perfectly herbivorous. They, you know, many animals that we consider herbivores, including early humans, probably ate little bits of animals at least. And humans as modern humans spreading across the globe over the last you know, few millennia, um, 
although we may physiologically emulate a lot of uh, more herbivores, um, we are kind of technivores. We have been using technology to eat all kinds of things and survive all over the globe and spread everywhere. So I think the question is less relevant than people think it is. Okay. Yes, we are analogous to herbivores. Herbivores aren't always 100% plant-based though. Uh, most of them aren't actually. Um, but we can probably eat all kinds of things because of our technology enabling us to do so. And uh, actually, you know, even the gorillas aren't perfectly vegan, as I mentioned, okay? But they do get enough protein, all right? And when it comes to vegan nutrition, protein, where do we get our protein? So we want to look at the whole food protein sources like beans, lentils, sprouted lentils, hemp, quinoa, all these things. And there is probably a role for some moderately or more processed foods, um, but the best ones amongst them. So things like uh, some veggie meats can be okay. Uh, soy milk is a little bit processed, but pretty close to a whole food and, uh, and, and all these. So the whole grains, nuts and seeds, and um, uh, lentils and beans, that's where we're going to get the majority of our protein from, okay? Uh, 2016 was the year of the pulses. Appreciate pulses. They're super sustainable in all kinds of ways, grown all across the globe in almost every region where people actually live. Not everywhere, but almost everywhere, and fantastic for us. Um, and I've mentioned these already. These are the sources of our plant-based protein. And a few favorites, right, are things like soy milk. I, I tell my parents, drink, you know, three glasses of soy milk a day at least because it is so high in protein. It is so sustainable. And as I will mention later, there's benefits of soy for the environment and health. Um, hemp protein, plant-based smoothies, are nuts and nuts, butters, and the best of the veggie meats, okay? Um, protein requirements, we probably, you know, it's it's... Um, usually said that we need about 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of our body weight. And that's kind of our sweet spot for that'll cover the protein needs for most people. Um, we can up it a little bit because sometimes plant proteins are a little bit less digested. So we can go up to one gram per kilogram and that's also easier to remember, but that's one gram per kilogram of ideal body weight. So if somebody's really skinny, then we can look at what their ideal body weight should be. And we may want to up that protein. And if somebody's overweight, then uh, you don't necessarily go have to go one gram per kilogram. In that case, you might be okay with a little bit lower, okay? And sometimes people are uh, protein obsessed and they're eating way too much protein, but people are so variable. I also meet people who are plant-based and vegan and vegetarian who eat far too little protein. We should remember that people who are elderly and if you're pregnant or lactating, that you gotta make sure you get that one gram per kilogram. You need more protein in those cases, but it doesn't mean you need more than a gram per kilogram, it just means you've got to be at that one gram per kilogram um, uh, level. Uh, people are concerned about low lysine levels and some less or more amino acids in different plant uh, proteins in sort of grains versus lentils and beans. So just remember that your beans and lentils, quinoa and hemp are higher in lysine. And that doesn't mean that you have to worry about uh, whether you're balancing these amino acids. It just means you got to take, you got to make sure you're getting some beans and lentils or quinoa and help into your diet over the course of a week. Okay. Even if you're not eating them every single day, but they should be a significant part of your diet. And then you're covered. You don't have to think about it anymore. Um, soy is one of the highest sources of protein. And again, I'm promoting soy milk over here. Okay. Um, you don't need to complement, uh, by the way, your proteins. People say you have to oh, complement, oops, uh, complement proteins. Like you have to have this food with this food to get a whole protein. You don't need to do that. Just make sure you're eating whole grains, nuts, and seeds, and make sure you're having lentils and, um, and, and beans as well. You can throw in quinoa and hemp into that category as well. All right. Take your B12. This is one of the things that we cannot get from um, vegan foods just coming from nature. B12 is not present in plant-based foods. So it is present in fortified foods. So the good veggie meats and uh, soy milk and other foods can be supplemented with B12, or we can just take a supplement of a thousand micrograms uh, a couple of times a week. Okay. There's a lot of uh, talks there telling us how much, how many micrograms of uh, B12 that we should be using. Um, and I find in practice that people are quite variable, right? Some people are just consuming fortified foods 
and you check their B12 and they're fine. And there's lots of people who are eating animal-based foods uh, of all kinds and still their B12 is low because there's variability between people and their absorption for whatever reason, just like some of us wear glasses, some can be nearsighted, some can be farsighted. Similar to that, uh, our B12 absorption can be variable and it can also change with age. So what I tell people is just, you know, we live in a developed country, check your B12 once a year, or maybe if it's good one or two years in a row, you can check it every two to three years. Okay. And then just stay consistent with whatever you're doing. If you're doing it right, doing it right, and you're getting a good B12 level, then stay with that. Um, if you start following a little bit low, make sure we're consuming fortified foods, such as you know, fortified plant-based milk, like soy milk, or, or start taking a supplement. Most supplements are a thousand micrograms. Cyanocobalamin is the most common type, the most cheap type, and the most shelf stable type of B12. So I recommend that one. And we can just take a thousand micrograms once or twice a week. And if somebody's older or needing uh, to catch up on their B12, you can go like three to four times a week. People do not need to take injections of B12. Okay, that's only a very specific type of person with certain disease that needs that. Um, and uh, there we go. The RDA is usually about three micrograms per day, uh, but more is suggested. And uh, especially be cautious if you're elderly, and especially even more cautious if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, because your baby's B12 depends on mom's B12. Okay, so. Uh, that is really critical. Calcium and iron. Okay. There are a lot of plant-based foods that contain a good amount of calcium and a good amount of iron. Okay. So we should just look up Google is your friend, look up plant-based iron, plant-based calcium, and look at the different foods that, um, that you have this, uh, that you have these uh, two nutrients, these minerals in. Okay. Now, look at the plant-based sources of iron there. And remember that uh, when you're taking vitamin C, at the same time as the iron. So combining the foods with, uh, with some fruit or yellow and red vegetables that usually contain vitamin C, you're going to get better absorption of iron. Okay. Consumed at around the same meal. And, uh, and, and so that's beneficial. So it doesn't mean you need to take iron tablets and broccoli and kale are high in iron, but they also contain vitamin C. So they're really great, uh, foods for, uh, for iron and, and healthy, in so many different ways. So make sure we include those. Calcium requirements are about 700 milligrams per day for adults, but this depends on the dietary recommendations by a different country. You know, different countries vary in their dietary recommendations. And, and so it's around there, but it also varies by age, pregnancy, lactation, and certain types of life, et cetera. So we want to make sure that uh, you can, you're taking at least 700 milligrams uh, of calcium and perhaps more, because sometimes in some stages of life, we may need up to, you know, 1,300 milligrams of calcium. And that's where things like soy milk really come in, because there are so many sources of plant-based calcium. However, to get to that level, which we think is really um, better, um, although research is a little bit, uh, still, we'd still like more research on that, um, going with the, you know, being cautious about it, you know, Things like plant-based milks are going to really make a difference here. Okay. Um, okay. There we go. Now, uh, vegans and fracture risk. We already went over this. And uh, as I mentioned, some of the things we want to do is a um, good amount of um, protein and calcium. Make sure our body weight is good. Uh, soy milk is a fantastic uh, source of uh, calcium as well. Uh, vitamin D may make a difference. Our B12 levels are important. Fruits and vegetables and diet quality are important for fracture risk as well. So, and, and finally, exercise. So make sure all of these factors are covered for bone health. Vitamin D3, um, is it really important for us to take and, and should we be uh, careful about having low vitamin D3 status? There's all kinds of data showing that people have sort of low vitamin D3 levels, but truly there's not a lot of evidence that shows benefit by supplementing. Uh, so it's a difficult question as to whether we should be supplementing for our low uh, vitamin D levels and, you know, the way we calculate our vitamin D levels, is it a good method of calculation in the first place? So not calculating our levels, but calculating what our blood levels should be, calculating what we call the normal range. There may be some, um, uh, we may not be as perfect in, in, in classifying that what we consider a normal range, range as we think. 
So maybe there's some benefit for vitamin D3, maybe not. But remember, there are vegan options available for vitamin D3. Okay, so if you are supplementing, then these are um, great options, and they're getting cheaper all the time. Um, but uh, you know, get sunlight. And there may be some benefit for people who are dark skinned, living in low sunlight areas, elderly people who are in so indoors all the time, not going outside, um, and so forth, you know, people who don't get sunlight. So maybe there's some benefit there, okay, but it's still controversial. Now, what not to eat? You know, these are all kinds of Indian sweets and fried foods. Uh, they're, they are vegan, they can be vegan, but they're not good for us, okay? potato chips, ramen noodles, lots of um, goodies that we can eat sometimes. I'm not saying you can never eat them, but we should be eating a lot less of them than we all would, than we generally do. Sweetened beverages, even orange juice is very high in sugar. We should rather eat oranges and apples rather than having apple juice and orange juice, which are extremely high in sugar. Okay, other vegetable juices may be okay, may be good, although you're losing some of the fiber when you consume them. So if you're having vegetable juices, you still got to eat vegetables, okay? Um, but they may be better for you or are likely a lot better for you than orange juice and apple juice, which sometimes can be really you know, fun to drink, but for the most part, eat the actual fruit, okay? And, uh, and, and drink water and uh, so forth, okay? So that's also part of the Canada Food Guide. They're telling us to drink water as our preferred beverage, all right? Um, so yeah, uh, when it comes to supplements, we know that you know B12 is important, but the rest of the supplements, it's hard to say. Maybe there's some benefit in some in other things like taking some zinc or selenium. It's we don't have good, clear evidence that these things are necessary for us to take. Um, zinc and selenium and a couple of other uh, nutrients are somewhat lower in a plant-based diet, but I don't think there's real proof showing that uh, the the slightly lower levels are causing a bad effect. However, being cautious, we can sort of look up plant-based sources of zinc, et cetera. And in the UK and in Europe, there's a veg one vitamin that includes things like zinc in, in it um, to sort of enhance what uh, somebody who's vegan or plant-based might get. Um, again, we need more research, but um, it's just something to be a little bit aware of, but not worried about too much. Now, there are some foods that are demonized. Uh, a few years ago, people were always demonizing gluten. Um, you don't hear about it so much anymore. Uh, people say that soy is really bad for you, that it'll cause breast cancer and thyroid problems. Again, those things are not true. And uh, we you know, have to be very careful about the things that are circulating in social media. And then even doctors and dietitians pick up on these things. Uh, whole grains are fantastic for us. When they say, when people say carbs are bad, refined carbohydrates are bad. So white rice, white sugar, white flour, those things are bad or any type of sugar really. But whole grains, lentils, fruits, when you're eating um, carbohydrates from a whole food, these are really good for you. Okay. Soy is safe. It's not going to affect us in terms of estrogen, in terms of sperm counts or uh, testicular function or testosterone or body mass or strength. Uh, or puberty, or anything like that, there's there's no real estrogen in soy. It's, always, it's often blamed for having estrogen. But what really it has are isoflavones, which have a tiny, 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 you know, minuscule estrogen effect, but they also have an estrogen blocking effect. And what we call, consider them to be as estrogen receptor modifiers. But animal foods, if the animal product comes from a female, so any meat that comes from a female fish or a female pig or other animal is going to contain real estrogen that has a real effect on the human body. Dairy has estrogen because the pregnant cow and the lactating cow has estrogen in her blood. And she's going to naturally have estrogen in the, in the dairy, even if it's organic and there's no hormones added, you're still going to have real estrogen there. And, and same with eggs, which come from a female chicken that has real estrogen. So all this blame of soy for estrogen is um, just made up stuff that comes from the meat and dairy industry and um, has spread around and caused a lot of misinformation. Um, soy, wh now why do I think soy is so good? Soy is the single most efficient um, source of protein in terms of the least amount of land use, water use, and it actually brings nitrogen from the air into the soil 
just like all other uh, legumes do, like beans and lentils. They all bring nitrogen from the air into the soil. They self-fertilize and they fertilize other plants that are grown you know, uh, nearby or plants that are grown the next year. If you plant soy or other lentils and then next year you plant something else, the previous year's lentil or the proximal lentils will help fertilize. So it helps reduce our dependence on um, fertilizers. Uh, they can be great for international development and protein sources and replace milks. They're great for transition foods. They have some of these, um, some research showing the reduction in cancer. Uh, they're shown to be good for the bones and also be uh, lower cholesterol and so forth. So soy is often unnecessarily demonized. Uh, people say that, oh, soy is GMO, but there's no evidence that GMO soy is worse than any other GMO. All the meat people are eating, most of it anyways, uh, the, animal, the animals themselves are GMO, they're fed GMO feed, and our, most of our plant-based foods are, are also GMO. There's no evidence that GMO soy is worse than any other GMO. This is just another thing that causes fear-mongering, uh, again, coming probably from industry, because soy is one of the major protein competitors out there, okay? Do we need to be organic? I think it's nice to be organic, but probably most people can't afford that. What we need to do is eat lots of um, healthy plant-based foods, whether they're organic or not, we're going to get the majority of our benefit that way. And if we can afford or find local organic food, that's great. We should, you know, definitely go for it. Um, there are some, maybe some added benefits and maybe some added ecological benefits. Um, but um, we have to also realize that we want to have a sustainable diet that most people can afford. All right. And Sometimes with organics, there are some drawbacks as well because it may take more land, more water. So there are ecological trade-offs for growing um, organic foods too. And it gets very complicated because maybe there are some practices that can still create high food density with organic foods without necessarily using more of these waters. But I think that's complicated and it's another discussion. Now, when it comes to plant-based milks, what about things like almond milk and oat milk and other coconut milks and all the other milks that are out there, cashew and so forth? Most of them are protein deficient, okay? They have like one gram of protein per serving versus soy that can have seven or eight grams per serving, just equal in the amount as dairy. As we mentioned, protein is important. We don't want to underestimate the amount of protein that we should be taking. And uh, there are a lot of pro people actually who are quite variable and having low protein diets. Uh, and when you take away their, their dairy milk or something like that, it gets even lower. So we need to replace uh, the protein. And soy protein is the best candidate for the health and ecological reasons I mentioned. And things like almond milk, which are so marketed so well, they were like white water. There's hardly any almond or oat or cashew in the, the milk created from those products. You should eat cashews, you should eat oatmeal, you should eat almonds, but the almond milk isn't a great source of, of, those, of those foods. So I think soy milk is the winner in terms of plant-based milks. There's some studies showing that oat milk is more sustainable. Um, yeah, maybe it takes less resources to create per serving, but it, it takes more resources to create per unit of protein. And that's the better way to measure the impact of the milk. When it comes to low carb diets, They've been quite popularized. There's Paleo, Zone, Atkins, South Beach, and now there's Keto diet that's always being um, popularized. And do we, do we need to eat that way? Is there evidence about uh, low protein, low carb, sorry, high protein, low carb diets or um, uh, low carb diets showing that they're better than plant-based diets? Um, in most cases, the plant-based diets are shown to be better than the high protein, low carb, or better than the keto diets. However, when the high protein, low carb diet, or the keto diet is actually completely plant-based and made up of really good plant-based foods, maybe there's some equivalence there. Okay. So uh, if we're plant-based, high protein, low carb, or plant-based keto, you know, maybe, you know, there is evidence showing that that's healthier than the, the typical uh, animal protein version of those diets. Uh, now, that's, you know, an, a study here just showing that, you know, a, a low carb, high protein diet uh, showed higher mortality rates in two cohort studies. This is a 2010 study. There's other studies that show similar things. But again, these are not comparing 
a very uh, plant-based uh, low-carb diet or plant-based high-protein diets. Okay. Um, superfood tips. I think I've gone through these. Uh, lentils and beans are, are amazing for us. Soy, soy milk, nuts and seeds. We should remember those. There's good evidence that nuts and seeds um, have, have health benefits and uh, things like broccoli, kale, but having that variety of tasty whole foods um, is really important. Okay. Another tip that I have is that instead of having white rice, you know, use brown rice or whole grain rice, uh, mix quinoa and uh, barley in there too. And that's the way we cook rice at our house. And so that makes rice into a much healthier option. When it comes to uh, processed foods, we say that they're not good, but some of them actually may be okay. And this comes into play when it when, with regards to transition foods or veggie meats, right? Um, when we're consuming veggie meats, they're convenient, they can be tasty for people who are grown up eating these types of products, um, you know, the meat versions of these things. It's easier to go plant-based when you can still include a plant-based version of these things, which are culturally familiar and, and so forth. You know, after a good workout on a busy day, a plant-based sausage with close to 30 grams of protein is very convenient, right? but we have to know which of these are the best, okay? For example, um, field roast sausages in Canada are low in fat, low in saturated fat, and reasonable in terms of sodium content, okay? So that would be a good choice. And they also have a high organic content. Same with the tofurkey sausage, but the field roast, other products from field roast, not the sausages, but other products may have higher amounts of sodium and so forth. So you have to sort of look at which product it is. Um, I sort of say that there should be about 200 milligrams of sodium for every 10 grams of protein. If we're going above that, we're getting into a higher range and we should be at that level or below. A trick also is if you're using something like these veggie sausages, you can chop them up, put them in your pasta, uh, so forth, but then don't add some extra, add extra salt, right? So the salt from the product will be the salt for that goes into the actual completed meal and you can stay within reasonable sodium levels. So we have to be smart about how we use them. When it comes to products like Beyond Meat and, you know, Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger and so forth, they contain things like palm oil, or in many cases, coconut oil. And coconut oil is a saturated fat, and that's not good for us. Okay, so watch out for the sodium, watch out for the saturated fat, and look at the best of the products. And they can be uh, a reasonable part of a plant-based diet. And I'm not suggesting that somebody should only eat these things or that somebody needs to eat these things. I'm just saying a reasonable quantity can be a healthy option if you choose the best ones. Okay, this is like a tofurkey sausage, and it just shows the amount of sodium there, which is which is not too bad. This is from an older product, but the the, the newer tofurkey sausages are in line with that. Um, oils and uh, so nuts and seeds, as I mentioned, are really good for us. Um, and the oils, well, you shouldn't necessarily eat too much oil. And there's controversy around this because there's some studies show that maybe olive oil is beneficial for us, if it's you know extra virgin olive oil and so forth. Um, these studies are a bit. Um, you know, they're not 100% conclusive. I wouldn't say that any one study gives us the last word on this, but it does show that for the average person, for regular people consuming some oil, if it's coming from olive oil, flaxseed oil, canola oil, or some of the other plant-based oils, um, may be okay for eating reasonable quantities. And we are also not eating so much that we're overweight, et cetera, okay? But saturated fats, uh, is not good for us. Cholesterol is definitely not good for us. Trans fat, when you take polysaturated fat and you heat it to high temperatures, you develop trans fats. So frying foods, but also products that contain trans fats are not good for us. A ghee, which is um, uh, butter that is uh, heated to high temperatures, which causes chemical changes is not good. Even though all kinds of, you know, uh, internet articles and people say that ghee is good for you, compared to the plant-based options, it is not good for us compared to those options. If you're somewhere in the world and you're starving, you're not getting enough food, then yeah, go ahead, have ghee, have animal fat, have coconut oil, palm oil, because you're not getting enough to eat. But if we're getting enough to eat, we live in a developed country and you have these plant-based options, then the plant-based options are better. Remember what I said before, the research all, always tells us what is the effect of this compared to this. So yeah, ghee compared to starving is better. But if you're having olive oil compared to ghee, then the olive oil is going to be better, okay? And that's the way we should understand medical research. 
There are some people who say that sunflower and safflower oil, those types have higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, and they may not be good for us. Um, but I find that the research is not as conclusive um, uh, as, as, as I would like to see. So I'm not convinced of this myself. And there's actually at least one study showing that those plant-based oils are still beneficial compared to animal-based oils. Okay. I've mentioned it before, uh, the junk food, we want to steer away and go for the whole foods. Omega-3s, we've reviewed. Um, oh, algae omega-3, sorry that some of the slides are a little bit duplicates here. Um, fish consumption, raw versus cooked, okay? Now, some people say that, oh, we should have an all raw vegan diet. That's not true that it's better. Many nutrients are more available to us when we cook the food. Now, that doesn't mean we should overcook the food, but cooked food does release more nutrients of certain nutrients from certain foods, okay? Um, so we shouldn't be too strict. Some raw food is gonna be great for us. We should include some raw food, but we should also eat cooked food. So people who are getting very strict and they have to be on a raw food, plant-based diet, I think there could be some drawbacks in many cases. And, and we've seen examples of this as well, okay? If somebody is raw food, make sure that you're getting all the food groups, careful not too much sugar and get enough calories, okay? But I still think it's better to have a combination of raw and cooked food. Uh, pregnancy, lactation, childbearing, protein, calories, B12, calcium, folate, vitamin D, iron, you know, and maybe omega-3s too uh, are going to be good for us. Women should take a prenatal vitamin, okay, when they're pregnant and breastfeeding. Um, and there's some great books like Vegan for Life, uh, a book that uh, goes through a lot of these stuff. There's, I'll go through some more books as well. Now, what about if you're underweight or overweight or an athlete, et cetera. Remember, we should adapt our diet to our needs. Being whole food plant-based isn't an automatic win. If we're an athlete, yeah, adjust your diet to have the more protein and calories that you need for yourself. If you're underweight, you know, increase the healthy foods that have more calorie density and protein and other nutrients, but using the best ones. And overweight, again, same thing, cut down on certain things, as well. So I've seen, you know, people who are plant-based or vegan and underweight and overweight, and we all got to adjust, you know, being vegan by itself is not going to solve every problem. You have to rationally adjust the diet to suit your needs. Okay. Same when it comes to cultural specificity. So if somebody comes from an Indian background or a Mexican background or from Russia or um, China or whatever, and we're prone to eating our own cultural foods, we can adapt. Okay. There's always a way to adapt. And that's really, really important for the vast majority of cultures. It's not too hard to do. Okay. And um, like I said, you know, we can, you know, see our doctor, check your B12, check our hemoglobin and um, you know, be careful about a couple of things, adjust as necessary, um, but we're most going to have good food, good news if we do it right. Um, foods to avoid. I'm sorry, that's a redundant slide again because I've combined a combined a couple of presentations to make this one. And one of the things we should go here is that we should talk about the Canada Food Guide. Oh, time's it right now? Oh my gosh, I'm going over time, aren't I? Um, and uh, and that's highly plant based now. Now I'm just going to skip forward and uh, show a couple of great resources for plant based health professionals. Our website and there's a little thing called resources there which show us more things. This um, academic paper and this clinical plant-based nutrition um, textbook actually are great examples. And I'll provide, I'll share my slides so that, and, and these resources as well, so you can, so you can share it out to the, to the audience. Um, the Eat Lancet um, Commission talked about having a more a whole food plant-based diet for the planet, for planetary health. And Nicholas Carter has mentioned that in his presentation as well. I'll briefly touch on pandemics. And that is to say that most of us don't know that various um, diseases throughout the course of history and that also affect us in today's time have come from animal agriculture to humans. That includes COVID-19, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, coronavirus um, uh, in 2003, 2002, uh, swine flu uh, in 2009, HIV, Ebola, the Spanish flu um, of the early 20th century, and, and others too. Okay, and that breeding animals in large, large quantities becomes a biogenerator for viruses and many types of variants, which then come back and can affect humans too. There's a presentation I did on this, which I'd love for people to hear. And uh, there's also a um, uh, section on plant-based data about this subject, and it's really critical, okay? Um, 
So, okay. So, and there's also, you know, in, COVID is less relevant now, but people who are on plant-based diets actually had lower rates of death from COVID. Um, and so there was benefits even there. Um, conclusions, uh, you know, plant-based diet is fundamental to sustainability, but it's also it's also very um, fundamental to our ongoing health uh, if we do it in a very um, uh, high quality way, which is not too hard, okay? Um, and it can reduce the risk of future pandemics. So there we go, I should wrap up there. <laughs> I'm sorry that I've gone over time, and uh, but I do, uh, you know, I'm gonna stop the slide share and I know you have a couple of questions for me too. Uh, I wish I could say I had a couple of questions. I have a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot that's come forward here. So um, I'm just, uh, I'm going to pick some, and I, my, my apologies to anybody whose questions I don't get to. Uh, Stacy is a nurse um, here in British Columbia, and her question was, do you ever tell your patients in the ER about plant-based diets? And if you do, what is your approach? You do mention you get heart attack victims in. Yeah, I mean, we see people who suffer from serious diseases that we know can benefit from, uh, you know, a whole food, plant-based diet, okay? So that includes cardiovascular disease, includes uh, diabetes, obesity, um, and people who are worried about cancer risk. Maybe they have a family history of cancer, et cetera. Um, dementia, maybe you have a risk factor for dementia and somebody's you know, in their 50s, they're a little bit worried about um, their memory or something like that. And so emergency department, we have very brief interactions with patients, and usually not subsequent uh, interactions with patients, we might see them once, and sometimes we might see them more than once. Um, I would ask a person who um, suffers from one of these problems, or is at risk for one of these problems, and that's part of their reason for being in the emergency department, mm -hmm. I might briefly ask them if I have some time, like, are you interested in lifestyle and dietary measures that might help you prevent a bad outcome from, from, from cardiovascular disease or whatever you're worried about, whatever you're here for right now? Um, and in many cases, they say, yeah, you know, I am really interested. Then, then I say, you know what, let me give you a couple of websites to look up. And I might give them a, something like, um, I might suggest Plantrition Project, uh, which is um, a, a great resource for patients. They have a lot of patient-facing resources. Or Forks Over Knives, which has uh, great resources for people, especially um, who might be at risk for heart disease. Um, and they can look at the website, they can get free recipes, et cetera, as well. So these are free you know, resources which with that are free for people and that I think that are good quality. They can also go to our website and click in the top corner uh, resources and get many more, much more information. But I generally don't promote my own website there. Um, I'll promote somebody else's thing. So I don't, I, it's, it's a professional setting and I don't want to sort of self-promote there. Um, but those are two go-to um, resources, which I think can, people can click and see. We have a lot of South Asian patients. So there's also something called PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And they have um, guidelines for South Asian diets to be whole food plant-based. So I tell them to Google PCRM Healthy India. And that takes people to a page where there's like um, whole food plant-based for South Asian style recipes. Um, in the States, there's a lot of resources for people with um, sort of Hispanic cultural backgrounds um, on PCRM and plantation projects as well. So, um, because they're from the US. And so there's, you know, good cultural resources out there as well. So I'm gonna stick here for a moment with your, with uh, hospitals. And um, there seems to be a hesitancy in hospitals, care homes, various institutions to move towards having default plant-based meals where people can add meat if they want to. Why do you think this is? Uh, just recently, I'll just use an example. Just recently, I was in the hospital because um, I was hit by a car and I had to overnight there. Sorry. And uh, they asked if I was hungry, if I needed anything. And I said, well, I don't know if you have anything. Um, I'm vegan. And they went, well, yeah, we have probably white bread and peanut butter. So mm -hmm. why is there? A, mm -hmm. Why do you think there's a hesitancy in an institution that's based on health? Well, I think that 
our healthcare system reflects our cultural backgrounds, right? Most of us are, you know, in Canada and North America, most of us in the world come from a cultural background that in that is not plant-based. And so our institutions have been this way for many years, just reflecting what people normally consume in the population anyways. When it comes to dietary information and um, research showing that plant-based foods are, are beneficial for the health, for our health, this research is coming out over the last 15 to 20 years and getting stronger and stronger, is building momentum, but it's kind of new, right? And more and more doctors are becoming aware of this. And I think as more and more doctors, dietitians, and so forth become aware of this, um, nurses too, um, I think it was Stacy who was just speaking, uh, asked the question of Stacy, Stephanie. Um, for all of us, you know, we will slowly move our institutions, but it's going to take a lot of work because it's like taking a big ship and changing the direction that takes time, but we really have to be advocates for it. And uh, I do see some changes and there are some environmental organizations uh, that try to reduce the footprint of healthcare. And so, and, and often they are recommending more plant-based uh, options as, you know, diets as well. Um, and it's a good learning opportunity for people in the hospital uh, to, who are, when you're hospitalized, why not learn to have a better diet at that time as well, especially for people who are there for you know, reasons of these chronic diseases or heart disease, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a good teaching opportunity as well. So there's a lot of benefits to gain here, um, but it's going to take work to sort of move these big ships. Well, our Canada food guide seems to be ahead of some of our hospitals, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, yeah. and it's the first Canada food guide that we have that had yeah. no industry influence. But when Perfect. you... You know, when you have a change in government and different politicians and different lobbyists, I'm not sure what will happen to the next one because you might have lobbyists that influence the politicians that allow industry to have a say in the food guide again, right? So, um, but many food guides, well, or a few food guides in different countries, Canada's not the only one, are starting to recognize the more um, plant-based uh, you know, diet is, is healthier. And, and sometimes uh, there are competing interests there because the industry, the interest from industry is very, very, very powerful. I mean, these guys have like millions, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars actually in their marketing, advertising, promotion, lobbying, et cetera. So uh, they have quite a strong effect. So Debbie has a question on um, if there's been any studies on the effect of adrenaline cortisol, lactic acid, and blood glucose, blood glucose that's produced by the stressed animals and that, that, are, that, that people are eating. And that impacts on the health of humans that ingest their flesh. To my knowledge, there aren't any clinical studies about this. Now, remember, when I talked about clinical study versus bio, uh, bio like sort of... Uh, um, uh, just a, 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 what we call basic science study that study that's done in animals studies that's done in test tubes study that measures certain things in food and then infers that this might be better for your health um, in terms of clinical studies i don't think there are any studies that look at that now i would bet you that there are some companies who sell organic meat or say they have happy chickens or free-ranged eggs or something like that that will say that our eggs are better than regular eggs. So now we're going to promote our eggs and then they're going to scale up production of some kind of healthier egg or healthier version of milk. We see these A1, A2 milks. We see other types of milks that are grass fed and all these things, but there's no clinical evidence that any of these things are healthier than the run of the mill type of animal product either, because they contain also saturated fat and all these things. Now, some of them may can, can contain less saturated fat, um, in which case maybe they're a little bit, you know, um, uh, less harmful compared to a healthy plant-based option. You know, like they're, they're less harmful than the regular meat, but maybe not as good as a healthy plant-based option. All right. Um, but we have to be careful because most of this research is going to be done by industry to try and promote some newer version of some animal product. And we have to distinguish what proper clinical research is and not be fooled 
by some kind of um, surrogate uh, marker that they're telling us uh, and, and, and then promoting health benefits that doesn't come from clinical research. How do we find out who funds research? And, you know, the statements are made all the time. Statements appear on ads, statements appear. I read somewhere that, and somebody will give you a fact as they see it and as they read it. This gets we double check everything. It's, it's, it's a fair bit of work. This gets very complicated. And there's a, the, the first thing to say is that there's a huge amount of misinformation and disinformation, you know, information that's uninformed, information that's being put out there specifically to promote something in the industry, in the industry's interest, basically in most cases, really, you know, there's, there's money behind it. Okay. Yeah. And, and it used to, in, in, the, in the past, um, there was a lot of studies and it would say at the bottom, you know, funded by the egg marketing board of this or the milk marketing this or dairy, you know, farmers of this country or dairy farmers of Canada, et cetera. There was, a, you know, you know, the Cattlemen's Association, et cetera. You, you would see those things on the research that were, that they were funded by these organizations. Now, over time, uh, more and more people saw that and they didn't like it. And, you know, initially it didn't seem like a big deal. It just, hey, we funded this, so we're going to write it down because we're supposed to. Um, but now people started cluing in that, yo, this research is being funded by these industries and coming up with certain results. It's the same with the drug um, in medication industry. If a study is funded by the drug company, it's probably going to show a benefit of their drug, okay? Uh, compared to if it's studied by like a university that's not funded by the drug company. Now, over time, more and more of the funding is becoming obscured. So you have an animal agriculture company that's funding another company that funds another company that maybe then funds the research, and it's getting harder and harder to know. At the same time, sometimes there are plant-based researchers or people doing research on dietary parameters that they don't have any funding. And the only way they can get enough funding to do research is sometimes go to industry and get some funding too. So sometimes that's the only way to get enough funding to do a big project because it is very expensive. Yeah. Key thing is to look at the methodology. Look at how the study was conducted. Look at the parameters that were in the methodology. And when you look at the methods and what people are studying, the answer usually lies there that regardless of the funding, the methodology is bad. And when we see that bad methodology, often, or, you know, it's, it's correlated with, uh, you know, some industry funding interest. Um, but uh, in some cases, it may be funded by industry, but the methodology is also really good. So then we would say, hey, okay, despite the funding, we see really good methodology, and we see that this is a good study. So the funding um, by itself isn't an issue. It's looking at the methodology, and then also kind of looking at the funding at the same time. And, uh, and, but the methodology is always the most important part, because even if they claim no industry funding, sometimes there's obvious problems in the methodology. I'll give you a good example. There are studies that say carbs are bad for you, but in those studies, they do a very classic thing. They don't look at the difference between refined carbohydrates and whole grains. And so it's just basically a major flaw in the methodology right from the get-go. And if you're not separating those things, then the study as far as... Uh, Tushar, you seem to have frozen at your end. So we're just going to wait a few minutes for Tushar to um, come back. Um, I still have a few more questions. We can hopefully get to it. Just going to check on the time here. We're already at um, 10 minutes after the presentation uh, scheduled end time. And okay, it's just me. All right, so um, I think what we'll do, since the presentation has already gone over time, I think that uh, we will call it a close for today.
Uh, my apologies I, uh, to the people that I didn't get to the questions of. I have them all highlighted here, and I was going to go through as many as possible. Aha, he's back. I'm back. Sorry about that. It might be an internet issue on my side. All right. Well, then, we're going to just continue. We just have a few more questions, and we'll try to stop at quarter after the hour. Um, do you mind if I go to the next question, Tushar? Okay. Go ahead. So John had a question about Alzheimer's and is there any evidence that omega-3 fatty acids actually help prevent Alzheimer's? That's a good question. I, I think there are some, um, I, I don't think there's good evidence. There's not good consistent evidence that omega-3 fatty acids prevent Alzheimer's. Um, or we shouldn't say Alzheimer's, we should talk about dementia. Um, because I think dementia is the real end problem that we're looking at. There are many mechanisms that cause dementia. One of the major uh, mechanisms that causes dementia is that over our lifespan, we develop cholesterol plaques in our arteries. Okay, When they cause a lot of blockages in our heart, it leads to heart disease. And when a plaque ruptures, it can cause a heart attack. Uh, and also can limit flow to the heart, then affecting the health of the heart. But this occurs throughout the body, and it occurs in the brain as well. So when these very small blood vessels in the brain gets clogged off and gets narrow, 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 and eventually get plugged up, it's tiny, you know, there's a small amount of cells in the brain that die in thousands and thousands of areas throughout the brain. So your brain becomes more and more kind of like Swiss cheese. There's not an actual hole, but there's a shrinkage of the area where the brain cells die, and you sort of get shrinkage of the brain tissue. That's one of the major, major causes of dementia, okay? And uh, so it's a blood vessel uh, cause. When we protect our blood vessels through having a very uh, low saturated fat, uh, low refined carbohydrates, low cholesterol, but high in things like plant proteins, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and, and all the good stuff that we've been talking about. That protects us from heart disease, but it also protects our brain. I used to think, well, we have protection from heart attacks and heart disease with a plant-based diet and cardiovascular mortality. Why don't we have reduction in stroke? Because there isn't good uh, evidence showing a reduction in ischemic stroke, like the strokes caused by a blockage, similar to how a blood vessel would be blocked and give you a heart attack. But what there is evidence is that we do have protection in the small blood vessels that, um, that, uh, that are so important for our brain health. And protecting those blood vessels protects us from dementia. So a plant-based diet, uh, can be really good for this. And I think that that's far, a whole food, good quality plant-based diet can be protective of dementia and that um, uh, over the long, over a long period, this is not like some instantaneous thing. This is over a long period, over a long time scale. And that um, uh, omega-3s are, you know, of far lesser importance, even if they do benefit, it's probably of far lesser importance. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to um, snack food, uh, we know that snack food overall, it's, it's not a good idea, vegan or not. But Mo was wondering, has there ever been a comparison of the bad omnivore type snacks versus the bad vegan snacks? Do, do, can, can, can we hold our head a little bit higher as we chow down on our potato chips versus them chowing down on their pork rinds? Hmm. I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, we, can, we, we do have some information that processed meats have you know, higher rates of certain cancers, heart disease, et cetera. So um, processed meats being worse than red meats and red meats being worse than, than, um, than let's say, meats that come from bird type animals and, and then fish being the... Um, um, the sort of best of the lot, you could say. Um, but uh, I don't think in terms of snack foods, we have specific uh, 
clinical studies, but the data may be available, but I'm just not aware of it. But I, I don't think it's a really, really super important point. You know, the, the main thing is that, yeah, we're going to have some junk food here and there. Nobody's going to be like 100% perfect all the time, or maybe some people will, but few people will, right? What we want to be is we want to be good 90% of the time, yeah. right? And we want to be good 90% of the time. And occasionally, if you have some candy or a bit of potato chips or some sweet or something, then that's probably all right, okay? Because we know that if we restrict ourselves too much, then some people just give up on the whole thing, actually. So allowing ourselves a little bit is cool, but we just got to make sure that it's a little bit. Would you choose corn chips or potato chips? Um, From a health perspective. <laughs> it's, 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 it's tough to say. You know, when we eat corn chips, if there's a low sodium version, maybe they're a little bit better and you have them with your like Mexican food meal, right? Or your yeah. Tex-Mex meal. Um, so it, it, it's like that. And even some things that we consider staple foods, like you might go to have some Indian food somewhere and they'll provide you with white rice or a Chinese restaurant, you might get white rice. Yeah. So even that's not a great food, right? But here and there, it's going to be okay. Now, um, you mentioned before that juices aren't the best. Um versus actually eating the whole fruit. But as some people do juice at home and they put the whole fruit or the whole veg in. I, I think um, what happens with vegetable juices, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. When it comes to vegetable juices, um, there's a lot less sugar involved. Part of the problem with the fruit juices is the high sugar load. So if you have a high sugar load from your fruit juice, that's not good. Okay. Um, if you're eating fruit that happens to be low in sugar, you have some fruits that are not so high in sugar, or you're mixing with vegetables and so forth, and your sugar load is not that bad. You're going to get a, a lots of goodies, but not a ton of sugar. Um, so that's the way you want to go. It's, it's the sugar load that's the biggest problem. And I'm just saying that juicing may be great, but don't forget to eat whole vegetables and fruits too, because of the fiber. Okay. So the sugar is an issue. The, the fiber and the rest of the excluded part, we should still have other food that gets you that, all right? And, and otherwise, the juicing should be good. Now, are there clinical studies showing that glute juicing is good, good for us over the long run? We don't have those, you know, studies with large populations showing that having this type of juice is showing, you know, results in lower cardiovascular disease. We're kind of inferring these things as being part of a, a whole food plant-based diet or close to a whole food plant-based diet, basically. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for going over time by 20 minutes. I really appreciate it. To those people whose questions I didn't get to, my deepest apologies. To share great information. I really appreciate everything that, that you told us that I was able to learn and your you taking your time to do this and answering all the questions that came through. You're very welcome. And it's my pleasure. And I hope that, um, yeah, we all keep um, healthy, uh, do the best we can. Remember that we also want to include good sleep and exercise and positive relationships and uh, limiting of things like alcohol and drugs and stuff like that as well, because we wanted to make a whole picture here. And um, in terms of plant-based diet, we want to make it as ecological as we can as well um, and uh, socially just uh, and, and all those things. So the health is important combined with those other things too. Absolutely. I, I, I definitely can uh, totally relate to what you're saying and I'm totally on board with that. So thank you everybody else for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming and asking your questions and listening today. And have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tushar. Bye-bye.